Hello, my name is Mordred Viking, and I'd like to welcome you to episode 32 of this Let's Play Victoria 2. This is the Army with a State, and we are Germany. I'm afraid that I managed to uh, <coughs> kind of spill a drink on my keyboard between episodes, so if there is a bit of a hum going on in the background, that's because my microphone's not plugged into the keyboard right now and is directly into the PC, and I know that vibrates a bit. So if there is a hum there, I'm sorry. There's not much I can do about it, but it is only going to be temporary. Right, so what are we doing? We are repaying debts, if I remember rightly. Let's just go ahead and unpause and continue skipping through time. <coughs> nice easy victory there. Then in fact he can come back over towards Austria. I think that the plan is basically we're just going to continue to pick on Austria. Abandon Egypt. Well, oh, that's not very nice. It's not very neighborly now, is it? Come on, you can be nicer than that. Uh, France is going after Poland. Not very heavily, though. Leaflet campaign. We covered the entire city. Me and the girl split up, met at the corner of Martin Main Street and 3rd, and went off to try to cover each block or two. It was hard work, but I remember it as a happy time. German suffragettes have undertaken a leaflet campaign in one of our states in order to gain traction for their cause. All around the city, women can be seen wearing placards and handing out leaflets asking for support for a whole host of suffragette causes, from property to marriage to domestic law to the vote and beyond. You've already got the vote. We're a very progressive society. Um, become more reactionary, or the upper house becomes more liberal. Well, take the liberal way. Thank you. Portugal goes bankrupt. How dare you. Let's repay another seventh of our loan. Now one thing which I was particularly proud of uh, looking between episodes is a large chunk of our poorest people have actually managing to afford their luxuries. That's freaking rare in this time period. Like I know their luxuries is probably like cigarettes or something but still. Like, the poor people in this era tended to be rather trodden underfoot shall we say. Like the rich were very very stonking rich but the poor tended to be not. And yet, yeah, they seem to actually be doing pretty well. So, good. Uh, we can reform this. I don't think I really want to. And we can get another technology. So I think we'll just continue with the factory input efficiency technologies. Factory input tech is important because it reduces the running cost of our factories. Oh, that was another uh, good question in the comments, actually. Uh, someone noticed that I try to run tariffs at a deficit. So we go into the negatives. And they were wondering, why do we do this? Surely this makes other countries around us more competitive. Yes, but it also means that we can buy raw materials for cheaper because we're basically subsidizing the factories in their acquisition of suppliers. And because our industry is so ridiculously strong anyway, I'm not worried about competition. The only thing I am worried about is keeping prices low so that we can export more at a low price as well. Furthermore, having low tariffs means that our people can buy in any supplies that we ourselves don't create uh, for very cheap as well. So if there is a um, luxury wood, uh, sorry, luxury, f no, what's the word? Tropical woods or opium or anything else nice like that. <laughs> can't believe I'm saying opium and nice in the same sentence. But you get what I mean. Uh, they can import those for cheaper, uh, anything that we ourselves don't produce. So that is probably contributing to why our poor people are able to afford their luxuries is because our tariff barriers are so low that other countries can afford to sell it to us far more cheaply than if they tariffs were high. Uh, national tragedy, that is unfortunate. So there you go. Explained. Um, we're still fortifying that border. You need to come home. When does our truce end? Truce with Germany ends in t four years' time. So in about two years' time, I think we'll prepare for another war. Armor-piercing exploding projectiles. These projectiles were specifically developed to penetrate the thick armor plates of the capital ships. I could have sworn I've read that one already. <coughs> the elections in Germany are starting. Jolly good. How are our politics looking? Oh, very liberal. Yeah, I'm pretty sure the liberals will still win. So that's fine. Marvellous. Are we still building ships? 
We are. And that's putting us further and further over our limit. So let's stop naval production for now. Because we really need to upgrade the uh, shipyards. Because we are horribly over our limit currently. And that is causing all of my ships to take damage, basically. Their, their base health is lower as a result. So I would absolutely love to be able to expand the number of shipyards that we have, but that takes time, and it's also kind of expensive, though expense isn't really that important. Uh, all clergymen are reduced or become more conscious. I'll take the consciousness. Thank you very much. And we can repay another chunk of this loan, which we shall do. Now, are there any other areas that we want to try and acquire? Cut down to size of Manchuria. I'm not surprised. Oh, not bothered by that. I mean, at some point, I would like to roll out the Navy and have another crack at the Royal Navy and see if we can actually break our way through. However, I think they still outnumber us just because our uh, naval yards aren't that high level yet. And I really want to cut Britain down to size. But that's going to be difficult. In fact, I'd like to... <laughs> and this is going to sound really harsh. I'd like to fully occupy Britain for long enough to drop them out of being a great power so they lose all of their uh, spheres. So they lose India, because India is basically just a whole bunch of tiny spheres. Okay, citizenship policy debated in Germany. We need to limit their citizenship, because that is what my liberal people want. Apparently. Onwards. We are still producing a whole bunch of money, most of it provided very kindly by the British, I believe. In fact, yeah, they are paying off my loans right now. If we didn't have the uh, British war indemnities, then we would be far worse off. So we pay another 100. We're down to just 130 pounds in interest, 6 million in the bank. Bolivia has acquired Peruvian Atacama from Peru. Economic policy. We are decisively arguing in favour of laissez-faire, which gets rid of planned economy, which I believe is the socialist one. So we might have another socialist uprising at some point. Uh, yeah, the communists are still organising. There's not that many of them, though. The next big chunk is potentially going to be the bohemians. Bohemian. Bohemians! Bohemia. Bohemians. There we go. More factory input tech. Marvellous. It's 84. That means that we can get another technology that we were, aha, waiting for. Right? No. Ninety-eight is what we were waiting for, I think. Like, I still want revolution and counter-revolution. I'm just somewhat concerned by the communist rebel organization gain plus 25% from the dogma of the mass action and the anarchistic bomb throwers and the terrorist cells and the various rebel organization gain in... Oh no, that's a decrease. Hmm. Mobilization impact minus 20%. Women's suffrage movement. Actually, you know what? That's fairly decent. Communist rebel organization gain plus 75%. Reactionary rebel... Organization gain. So we could have a lot more problems with uh, communists if we do that. No, I think I think we're good. We'll, we'll continue with the neoclassical theory just to make our factories even better. <laughs> um, while we are in the run-up to an election, can I for a short time go conservative? No, I don't think I can. Because then I could reopen a bunch of the factories that close. Although there's not actually that many. Capitalists are doing a pretty darn good job, actually, in keeping my factories open. And upgrading them. Now the projects pop up and immediately get funded. Can't even pause it quickly. There we go. It costs 2,000 and they've already put up 47,000. <laughs> wow. I don't think I've ever seen 9,900 investors trying to expand the luxury uh, furniture. 132,000 out of the 2.8 thousand needed. Yeah, our, our investors are all over this right now. There's not enough stuff for them to actually invest in. This is crazy. I don't think I've ever seen my economy this strong before, actually. Alright, so now we're making a silly amount of money again. We can uh, reduce our tariffs. Although I would like to try and keep a little bit of surplus, so... We'll drop you down to plus 500. That'll do. 
membership in the International Olympic Committee. The combination of renewed interest in ancient Greek civilization and the idea of sport as an important part of social development has led to a French aristocrat, Baron Pierre de Cometa, to propose reviving the Olympic Games as a way to promote international peace through friendly academic, sorry, friendly athletic competition between nations. Should our nation join his International Olympic Committee to organize the first Games? Excellent idea. Cost us 10 grand. Pfft, pocket change. Election is finished. The Liberal and the Anarcho-Liberals have taken power with 98% of the vote. We are a very liberal nation. I approve. <laughs> okay, so... You're not upgrading for some reason. You should be. In fact, considering how often we go to war with the Netherlands, we should really upgrade the quality of our fortifications on the Dutch border. I'm going to go back a little ways just so that we have a little bit more defense and depth and a bit more time to react to their threats in the future. Uh, upper house rearranged. Liberals actually lost 6% and everyone else gained a little bit. Wilhelm Roscher, a professor at the University of Leipzig. He was a founder of the German Historical School of Economics, which rejected the classical laissez-faire view. Oh, get out. Not welcome. Roche's work empathized emphasized the developmental character of capitalism through detailed historical analysis of the cultures of ancient nations. His System der Volkswirtschaft, five volume, 19, 1854 to 94, uh, ter, something of 13th edition, Principles of Political Economy, 1878, was an influential textbook in the second half of the 19th century. His most significant work is the Geschichte der National. Oenomic Oenomic in Deutschland, 1874 Sorry, my pronunciation there was terrible uh, Mayday Parade The red banners flutter before the winds and people of all ages come out to watch as socialists, communists, union members and workers of all ages come together in protest march all across the country commemorating the deaths of several demonstrators at a Chicago Haymarket massacre in 1886 while an annually returning celebration in almost every city in Germany, this year's incarnation has been a particularly successful one in our states, where an upsurge of socialist militancy and consciousness can be expected. So they become more militant, they become more conscious. I'm quite happy for them to become more conscious. Go for it. Demand more reforms. Expect more from your government. Um, which you will then pay for in increased taxes which is the complete opposite to liberalism. But we're, like, no holds barred when it comes to uh, free trade. Like, we're completely free trade with a bit of taxation. So we're, we're, we're probably a little bit more interventionist now than laissez-faire. We don't just let everyone do their own thing, considering we have, like, really potent safety laws and minimum wages. Though we don't have a limited workday. And we're bringing in pensions next, I think. Immigrant attraction. I think that the immigrant attraction only affects America and colonies. Neither of which we really have much of. Oh, hello. Oh, you're encouraging craftsmen. That's fine. Let's have a look at your state. How many of you are clerks? 4%. You need 10%. Why am I encouraging laborers here? Or craftsmen, even. Hmm. Oh no, that's in comparison to that. Never mind. Karl Marx. Karl Marx was originally the disciple of Hegel, but evolved his idealistic, idealistic philosophy. Later in Paris, he began mixing with members of the working class for the first time. Marx was shocked by their poverty, but impressed by their sense of comradeship. In an article he that he wrote for the Franco-German Annals, Marx applied Hegel's dialectic theory to what he observed in Paris. Marx, who now described himself as a communist, argued that the working class, the proletariat, would eventually be the emancipators of society. Marx's most influential works were The German Ideology, The Communist Manifesto, Principles of Communism, and Das Kapital. For most of his life, he lived in England, where he published his works, and from where he became the most influential socialist of all time. Yeah, there's, there, there's a reason we kicked him out of Germany. We, we have no time for that type of thing. John Stuart Mill was the son of James Mill, the famous utilitarian. He quickly became known as one of the more brilliant minds in the United Kingdom, and also one of the more radical. He published several books among them, A System of Logic, Principles of Political Economy, On Liberty, Considerations on Representative Government, and Utilitarianism, all of which made him the centre figure of social liberalism and a more humane view of society. See, John Stuart Mill, that's probably the kind of ideology that we are going towards. I had to study all that stuff at university. It was dry reading. We are losing money again. 
That's because the war indemnities against Britain have ended. Ooh, wow, they really were subsidising quite a lot. I think we're going to have to go to 0% tariffs. Oh, we are. Disappointed! Argentina has accepted the peace with Bolivia. Let's actually have a look at the Americas. We haven't looked over here for a while. Wow, Brazil has expanded somewhat. So has Bolivia. Blimey. South America is looking pretty different. USA is not very... Oh, no. USA is taking a bunch of land up here, and this is still British. Is this being colonized? Yeah, it's a colony. British Canada has, I guess, got independence at last. Africa is looking very Spanish, a bit of French. The British don't have as much as... I think a lot of this would have been French and British. Yeah, Africa's looking pretty different. India is what I really want to smash up. Australia, Asia, Java, and then the Chinese Empire. I was actually looking through the uh, Great Power list before I started recording, uh, noticing how small everyone's military was compared to ours, which isn't too surprising. And then kind of going through the Great Powers list and like, where's number two military? And I had to scroll a long way before I found it, bearing in mind that this is in order of country rating. Number two, the Chinese Empire is 64th overall, but with the second largest military. And they have number fifth largest and number ninth largest as well, Guangxi and Yunnan. Kind of crazy. There's a lot of Chinese people who can be called up to fight if they... Oh, hello. Wait, pause. Thank you. Uh, Britain. Right. Well, I wanted to ruffle stump Britain, so here's our chance. Schnoller's opposition of neoclassical economics entered, entered him into a famous methodological debate, modern Streit von with uh, Karl Menger. Although many argue that he lost the debate by the simple fact of non-engagement, it is reported that upon receiving Menger's investigations, he returned it unread to its author and published a semi-review of it, claiming that, indeed, it had not even been worth reading. Schnoller, nevertheless, retained his grip on the German university appointment system and kept classical and neoclassical economic theory largely out of German teaching, earning him the eternal enmity of not only potential challenger of the time, Sorry, of the only potential challenges at the time. Menger's Austrian school, Gustav Schnoller's political involvements were also important. In 1872, he formed the Verein für Sozialpolitik, Society for the Social Policy, a group of largely conservative economist, economists which supported a kind of corporatist state-industry-labor nexus. Liberals deplored their advocacy of state interventionism and came to label Schnoller and the historicists as Cather... Cather Cathedra Socialisten, or Socialists of the Chair. A jest they never entirely lived down. So it's kind of like armchair generals, but for politics. Okay, so we are at war with Greece and Britain. For once, we're not at war with Poland, which is pretty nice. So, with that in mind, we're going to whoop and whoop, which is now losing me a bunch of money. So we're going to up our tariffs to 10% which is actually going to largely pay for this war. And we're also going to make the uh, capitalists pay rather more taxes, because clearly they have far too much money if they're able to stump up that much cash uh, for the investments and things. And that will do, actually. In fact, no, screw it. They can pay the same amount as everyone else. They can pay 35%. It means that we're earning... <laughs> we're actually making a profit during this war. I might reduce tariffs again afterwards. So, with that in mind, what I think I'm going to do is get you guys and shift you over onto this northern border and basically say to Britain, come at me, bro. Let's do that. Meanwhile, our navies are hopefully going to start repairing a little bit, though we are massively over our limit. Serbia has gone bankrupt. That is unfortunate. And the other thing I would like to do is check up on my naval base construction, which unfortunately is progressing rather slowly. Keel's already maxed out. Stettin's maxed out. Tuchel is upgrading. Danzig is maxed out. Konigsberg's upgrading. Yeah, we have a lot of places upgrading. Uh, Egypt, we have been discredited, so we are once again growing in Egypt. And Persia, Russia has become friendly. So let's decrease Russia's opinion over here. And wait for the British to arrive. Come on then. 
It's mainly their navy, which I'm going to have to be worried. Oh, hello. Oh, you're going for my colonies. Yeah, there's not much I can do about that. But to actually get any war score in this one, Britain, you have to actually, you know, land in Germany. Good luck with that. Neoclassical theory. Marvellous. And with that, we have all of those done. I do kind of want that other national focus. Or we could get investment banks for additional tax efficiency and factory cost. You know what? Let's do that. I think that would be a good one. And hopefully the uh, tax efficiency means that our people will start paying more of the money that they owe us. Uh, so Poland is in our sphere. Is anyone else trying to go after Poland? Yes. Let's decrease Britain here so they can't just oust us. And they're actually hostile to Russia, which I like. That's another of the colonies. Doesn't count, Britain. Does not count. No, apparently it counts for 1%. Really? 1%? And you're going for Heligoland. Alfred Marshall. He was, first and foremost, a brilliant and original theorist. Wow, that is a glowing epitaph right there. <laughs> Doesn't say anything else about him, just say, yeah, this guy was good. He knew his stuff. Oh, come and attack me. Jeez. There's not much I can do against you because my navy sucks right now. Vilfredo... Parento, the Italian econom economist Vilfredo Parento, was one of the leaders of the Lausanne School, an illustrious member of the second generation of neoclassical revolution. Although only mildly influential during his lifetime, his tastes and obstacles approach to general e equilibrium theory were resurrected during the great Parentian revival of the 1930s and have guided much of economics since. Juan Juarez Juarez was elected to the Chamber of Deputies in 1885. Defeated in the 1889 elections, he returned to the University of Toulouse. No, Juarez, that would be French. He became increasingly radical in his political views, and after reading Karl Marx, he began advocating socialism. He was not a revolutionary and supported the independent socialists. While out of Parliament, Juarez com completed his mammoth socialist history of the French Revolution. He also joined with Aristide Birand and René Vivan Viviani, in the 1904 to sorry in 1904 to establish the left wing newspaper Le Humanité. in 1904 a new socialist party under Juarez grew rapidly at the beginning of the century but split over the correct response to german militarism Juarez advocated a policy of international arbitration whereas others supported the triple entente i would say the entente was probably a pretty good idea seeing as they actually won the war wow our consciousness is rather high interesting and we are once again earning money our rich pay almost as much as all of the poor people combined at the same tax level. That's pretty impressive. A major instance of voting fraud has occurred in an election for the local assembly in one of our states. We have every reason to believe that the vote was actually a major victory for local conservatives, but the Liberal Party has nevertheless claimed victory. Stepping in from a national level to correct these frauds is what is expected of, of us, and securing the conservative victory would o reduce overall the militancy in the area. But then again, maybe the Liberals would be better to have in power. Um... All pops in Pommen become 50% more conservative or become more liberal. But they become more militant. Let's have some militant liberals rather than some pacified com uh, conservatives. William Cunningham. Cunningham was a vocal opponent in the nascent neoclassical economics, particularly as propo propounded by his colleague Alfred Marshall in the Cambridge School. In economics, he sought to promote the historical method, making him one of the most leading advocates of English historical school. Despite the sustained attacks levied by Cunningham, Marshall has sufficiently influenced by his pleas to try and include some of the historical context in his work and operate more inductively in the derivation of his economic pr principles. However, he refused to accept Cunningham's main charge, that the validity of economic laws is conditional on historical, societal and cultural context. Cunningham's opposition to neoclassicism was not, was not only one of method, but also of politics. Cunningham was deeply opposed to utilitarian philosophy and laissez-faire politics, and penned several tracts defending labour unions and protectionism. He also resurrected much interest in old mercantilist thought. No, 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 no. Low tariffs. That's definitely what we want. Oh, we can go for the f low t pensions now. Let's do it. 3.3 3 million want of limited a work day, but no. Got to keep those factories churning out. Like, we're going to give you a lot of benefits, but you got to work for it. 
Uh, we've been banned in Egypt. They really don't want us in Egypt. Jeez. Slim picketings. Suffragettes picketing a local bar in one of our provinces are becoming the laughing stock of the entire state. The sight of two relatively frail, upper-class women standing in their placards outside the bar picketing for women's suffrage and temperance is not only being made into an object of ridicule, but is also causing some anger among the lower classes who feel that the well-offs, the high and mighties and the holy than now, are trying to patronise, or matronise as the case may be, them with sophistry and rhetoric. Freedom of speech and all that, so all poor became more militant or more consciousness. So if they listen more to these nice ladies trying to explain to them... I'd rather they were more conscious. You guys need to be cool. Oh no, you're actually. Hold up, hold up. The Alsing Patrimony game, Alsing as a core. Cool. Do we have any other units that have guards and stuff in them? Because apparently that unit had some. You. No, oh no, you're just artillery. You do. You two do. I'll bet that all of you combined equals one army. Or maybe slightly more. Uh, you have a lot of artillery for an army. You're supposed to have only four artillery. So let's split out until you only have four artillery. Otherwise, you are still lacking some stuff. What are you lacking? More guards. It's supposed to be ten guards. Ah, uh, screw it. You're fine. Wow, you have a lot of artillery as well. Not as many guards, but tons of artillery. Uh, so let's split some of those out. It would be lovely to know how many you have right now. Okay, I'm beginning to feel that you lot mixed in with you lot. And we would get another army. And you. In fact, let's have you all meeting... Here, where hopefully there'll be less supply issues. Upper house rearranged. Way less conservative, way more liberal and socialist. Eugen von Bohm Bauwerk. Bohm Bauwerk's career as a scholar was an intermittent one. The most significant span of scholarly activity was in his years at the University of Innsbruck, 1881 to 1889. It was during the 1880s that he first published two of the three volumes of his magnum opus, Capital and Interest. His later years were dominated by his duties as the Austrian Minister of Finance, a position he held, though not continuously, throughout the 1890s and beyond, and for which he is fittingly honoured by having his likeness on Austria's 100 shilling note. After serving in his capacity and assuming other governmental duties, he returned to teaching in 1904 with a chair at the University of Vienna. He became a colleague of Wieser, a wiser, successor to the retired Menger, students who passed through the university during the last decade of Bohm Berwick's career and life, he died in 1914, including Joseph Schumpeter and Ludwig von Mises. Thorsten Veblen. Thorst Thorstein Veblen is an... Thorsten Veblen is to economics what Johann Swift is to English literature, a master of the art of satire. It is essential to effective satire that this message be ambiguous. The reader should never be sure whether the author is absolutely serious or just pulling his or her leg. That quality is certainly present in Swift's Gulliver's Travels and is also present in Veblen's theory of leisure class, the instinct of worksmanship, Imperial Germany and the Industrial Revolution, the higher learning in America, absentee ownership, and his many essays. In fact, it is there in everything he wrote except the theory of business enterprise, which is as near as ever he came to writing a conventional academic book. No matter which of these books we open, we find the idea of that life in a modern industrial community is the result of a polar conflict between pecuniary employment and industrial employments, between business enterprise and the machine process, between vendability and serviceability, in short, between making money and making goods. There is a class struggle under capitalism, not between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, but between the businessmen and the engineers. Pecuniary habits of thought unite bankers, brokers, lawyers, and managers in a defense of private acquisition. I would, yeah, I, I, I can actually see that. Um, right. Two. And four. And ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I think the last one didn't give. And then two engineers. Close. 
let's no I think I clicked once too often no it should be 54,000 right you're suffering some attrition okay and then you that was not right let's get rid of you group you to create new unit right let's try that again one two one two three four one two three four five six seven eight nine ten one two now you should be able to split in half although there are a couple of guards missing and too many artillery one two one two three four one two three four five six seven eight nine ten one two and then you have got way too many artillery for your numbers you only need four Get rid of all of these. And that's better. You lot can head over here where you'll probably actually need to be split in two. Send you off like that. And then Romanaga. Diplomatic crisis. Between whom? Italy and Austria. Oh, I am totally backing Austria. Except for some reason I can't. Because I'm at war, maybe. Probably. Alright, so you need three more guards. That can be arranged. Build army. One, two, three. Cool. Fail to enlist international excitement at this time. Most unfortunate. Unfortunately, you lot are not repairing because our ships are still suck. King, we have finished the research of investment banks. Marvellous. Let's get ad hoc m uh, money bill printing because we're kind of almost... Oh, hello. Yes. Higher level navy. Dockyards. Excellent. Do it. Cole Menger. Menger has been hailed as one of the three leaders of the marginalist revolution of the 1870s, along with William Stanley Jevons and Leon Walrus. However, Menger's Grundsatze principles, published in 1871, eschewed all of the mathematical scaffolding that characterised the works of the other two revolutionaries. As such, many economists have insisted that Menger should be placed apart. In one sense, he can be considered different, unlike Jevons or Walrus. Karl Menger founded a proper school of thought, which has more or less retained its distinctive character since, namely, the Austrian school. His first... His two disciples of Vienna, Eugen von bohm bauck and Friedrich von Weiser, did much to advance and forge that school. And with that, we will need to end this episode. So, thank you very much for watching. If you are enjoying this series, then please do hit that like button. If you haven't done so already, then do consider subscribing. And if you have any tips or advice for me, let me know in the comments. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll catch you next time. Goodbye.